uh, as I alluded to earlier, we are studying in the book of Zechariah this morning. Uh, in fact, we are beginning and ending uh, Zechariah chapter 2, which is all consumed by this one vision, all 13 verses of it. Uh, so, let's go ahead and turn our eyes there. Uh, we can open our Bibles together to Zechariah chapter 2, and we'll just naturally pick it up at verse 1. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and its length. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares Yahweh, and I will be the glory in her midst. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares Yahweh, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares Yahweh. Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares Yahweh. And many nations shall join themselves to Yahweh in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And Yahweh will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before Yahweh, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. As we seek to understand everything this might mean, let's pray together. Dear Lord, your word tells us that if we lack wisdom, we should ask you for it and expect to receive it. So Lord, if we lack wisdom about any of the words we've just read and heard, then please give it to us. Give us understanding. God, as we pour into what these words might mean for your people today, reveal to us the story of our faithful God abiding with his children in every generation. Reveal to us the loving God who gives who gives the most precious gifts to his children, even our lives, even eternal life, and forgiveness of sins. Lord, show us the gospel in these words, especially if we've struggled to find it there before. God, for those of us who have come here today with injuries or ailments or just feeling somewhat weak or somewhat delayed. God, please don't let us be held back by the things we brought in through the doors with us. Give us strength. Give us focus. Lord, give us energy to have understanding, to see applications, to find the truth. In your glorious name, dear Lord, we pray. And we ask for your help so that we can give you even more glory in this world. Amen. So the vision jump cuts yet again. The last thing we saw were these four horns that had risen up that the angel revealed to Zechariah represented all of Israel's enemies, their powerful and dangerous enemies. And then he saw the four craftsmen that God said would be his plan to scatter the horns and, and overthrow Israel's enemies. We talked about everything that might mean last week, but now the vision has jump cut and, and Zechariah sees this young man 
And he's going out with a tool. He's going out with a measuring line in his hand. And Zechariah, just like we would be if we had seen this, wants to know what is this guy up to and, and what does this all mean? So he asks the young man, uh, where are you going? And the man answers, I'm going to measure Jerusalem because I need to see how long and, and how wide it is. He's off to mark the boundary lines for Zion. So in the context of the vision, he's like a surveyor. And maybe he's a builder. But he must go and measure the city because he's preparing to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And that kind of would make sense, right? Because we'd we just heard about how they have enemies and antagonists on, on every side. And in fact, they are building this temple in open defiance to the Persian overlords who rule over them. So, so maybe walls are a good idea for a people in such a precarious position. But as it turns out, walls are not part of God's plan and purpose for his people here. So that's why this angel comes running out and, and with a real sense of urgency tells another angel, hey, run and stop that man. Stop him and tell him that God has other intentions for this place. That God has other plans in mind. Tell him he can put his tools away. Because God says that Jerusalem is going to be a city without walls. The man in the vision seems to be representative of Israel's thinking, right? The, the minds of the men and women who Zechariah would have been preaching and speaking to in his own time. He seems to stand for Israel's expectations about what they thought God would do with their future. How God would deliver on his promises to reestablish Israel, to reestablish his people, to grow them and strengthen them and bless them, to let them dwell securely and, and safely. I mean, he gave that promise anew just back in Zechariah chapter 1. You know, he said that, he said that his people would overflow with blessings. This promise had been going out from the mouths of the prophets across generations. You can go back to the very first one of these Old Testament minor prophets that we studied in the book of Amos, and you can see him prophesying there that Israel would be destroyed, and of course it was. But then he backs that up by saying, you know, God says that judgment will not be the end of our story, and that's not going to be the end of the story of God and, and his chosen people. And he starts to reveal that this faithful remnant is going to be preserved throughout the exile and that someday they would return to the land and God would restore their fortunes and they would rebuild the ruined cities and once again live there. You can see that in Amos 9.13. And this is a message that was carried forward by so many of the prophets who came after him to faithfully wait on the salvation of God. Because even though terrifying things were about to happen. There was this promise for an even greater future, an even better Israel that would come out on the other side. And in the Israelite imagination, these ideas had kind of crystallized as they interpreted and thought about everything that the prophets had said and what it might mean that all of these promises of God, what they meant was that God would intervene and restore Zion to its former glory. That's what Zechariah's generation believed in and hoped for. They were waiting for God to come and overthrow all of the other kings who ruled over them and to just give them back everything that Assyria and Babylon had taken away. They were waiting for God to, to bring back the abundance of people. To bring back the abundance of prosperity. Good harvests and good trade and good, 
Well, good wars that would expand the country like it was in the past. To bring back the temple and to bring back the priesthood along with it. Perhaps most of all, to bring back their king. Israel had lost so much when that judgment of God finally came down and the foreign armies crashed through the gates. They had been dwindled down to, as Amos said, just one in ten of what they were. But Jeremiah is the one who gives us the better picture of it. Uh, You can hear heartbreak and sadness in the prophet Jeremiah's voice in the book most appropriately named Lamentations. Just look at Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. Can you imagine going to like downtown LA around SoFi, let's say, or I don't know, what's another big city that you're familiar with? Dallas, New York, whatever. Go to any of the mega metropolises in America and imagine standing on the street corners and just seeing so few people that you actually are compelled to say, it's so lonely here. This place is so empty that the city feels lonely. That's what Jeremiah sees when he looks out at Jerusalem. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she has become. What great loss she's experienced. And this city that was once like a princess has now become like a slave. Lost all of its prestige, all of its majesty, all of its glory. And now it's this kind of lowly and despicable place. So it's not hard to figure out why when the people of Israel thought, what does it mean for God to bless us? These are the expectations they came up with. Just that God would reverse all of the bad stuff that had happened to them. That his blessing was just meant to get them back to where they used to be. To bring Israel back into its glory days. To give them another king like David. Another temple like Solomon's. The abundance of wealth and fertility that their fathers and grandfathers enjoyed. If God's promise was to bless, then it's easy to see how they came to this belief that that was God's will for them. And that kind of thinking, that the promises of God are to take us back to what we used to have, that's what the man with the measuring line represents. All that is embodied in that character in this vision. That's why he wants to rebuild the walls. Because he's trying to bring back some of Israel's former glory. He's trying to recapture something of what used to be here. Because he thinks that's what God wants. That's what God has promised. So it really means something that the angel stops him. The angel stops him because God has spoken and God has announced that he actually has a different plan for his people. He has a different vision for the city. And the expectations of man and the will of God are kind of at an impasse here. That's the point of this vision. That's the message that goes out to Israel. That their expectations, everything that they think is supposed to happen, It's actually at odds with God's plan. The way that they are defining restoration, the way that they're envisioning blessing, are different from the way God is defining those things. So when the angel stops the man, that's God telling Israel, you guys need to change your expectations. You need to change your perspective. You need to listen to what I'm actually going to do. Because as it turns out, God's plan for Israel Israel is not to bring them back to the good old days. To rebuild the old things. Israel's idea of what it means for them to be restored was actually far too small. God had something much bigger in store. What God reveals is that what he's going to do is not to 
give them back old things, but that he's going to do something new with and for his people. He's not promising to make Israel great again. He's promising to take Israel and make it into something even greater. So he says, forget the walls. My people will dwell like a city without walls. Because those old boundary lines, what was the length and width of Jerusalem, it's not going to be big enough to contain my people. That's the promise that he gives when he, when he corrects the young man. What God shows Zechariah is that his plan to rebuild and restore his people is in line with his promises that he gave to Abraham centuries before. That when he talks about the restoration of Israel, he's talking about fulfilling fulfilling his covenant with Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12. That all the families of the world would be blessed through Abraham's children. That his children would outnumber the stars in the sky if Abraham could even count them. There's no purpose for these old walls because the family of God's people is going to stretch across the world. God just told him that in, in verse 11 here in Zechariah 2 that, that there's this time coming when many nations will join themselves to him and they will be his people. Now that language is highly significant. That wording is deliberate because that's, that's covenant language right there. That is actually the promise of the covenant between God and his people going all the way back to Zion. That God will be our God and we will be his people. God's plan that he reveals here is not just to rebuild this, this little city next to the Mediterranean Sea, but to call people from all over the world to leave Babylon, as he puts it, to, to escape from Babylon and come and run to him, to find refuge and safety in him. To put a word on that, we would call it repentance. <coughs> to turn away from Babylon, to flee from Babylon is to reject the world to turn away from idols, to come and submit to the authority of God, to put ourselves under the, the authority of His Word, to seek His will and His kingdom, to have covenant relationship with Him and be His adopted sons and adopted daughters. That's another reason why these walls actually don't need to be rebuilt. Because Israel is not going to try to keep the nations out anymore. God is calling the nations to come in. Because his vision for restoration, for rebuilding, is to graft all these nations into the family of his people and make it so that we can all dwell together as one. To dwell together as one and stand in the presence of our holy God. The announcement of this vision is that that is what God's will for Israel is. And what God has shown Zechariah here is that his plan, his promise, is to bring to the world the saving, redeeming work of Jesus, our Messiah. Because there's no other way that any of this stuff gets fulfilled. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of this vision. Jesus is the reason that young man can safely put his measuring line away and never pick it up again. Jesus is how these many nations get brought in. How God dwells with his people. How we get to sing and rejoice 
knowing that he's present with us. Jesus is God's program to bring all this to fruition. The gospel is God's plan to give Israel the greater future that the prophets had been talking about for centuries. Jesus is God's plan to make this greater Israel that he had been promising to his people. Our salvation. That's how this, that's how this becomes real. That's how God delivers on these promises. And where is our salvation to be found? Nowhere except in Jesus. How do people from the world come to the Father? Through no one and nothing except Jesus. Isn't that the promise of the often remembered verse, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. God promises that, that the nations will join themselves to Yahweh. We do that through the new covenant that is cut by the very blood of Jesus. That was his promise to the disciples when they, well, they were taking the Passover. We would say, you know, maybe they were taking the first communion. But, you know, when he took the wine and he said, this is my blood, he said, it's spilled for the taking away of sins and for the new covenant between God and his people. It's by Jesus' blood spilled at the cross, spilled in his atoning death that our sins are wiped away. That we are justified, that is, we are made right with God. And that we are welcomed into relationship with him. The most intimate kind of relationship as between children and their father. None of it happens without Jesus. All of it is delivered through Jesus. We can take a look at the book of Ephesians in chapter 2, which is such a concise and, and yet at the same time poetic and powerful declaration of the gospel uh, that Paul writes there in Ephesians chapter 2. We can find this in verse 13. <clears throat> but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, that's us, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The scriptures are replete with these reminders that, that it's the gospel that makes all this stuff possible. Paul would say again in the book of Galatians in chapter 4 at verse 4 that it is by the blood of Jesus that we are redeemed and that we receive adoption as God's sons and daughters. By the blood of Jesus that God gathers his people together from every nation. That he calls us to repentance. That he gives us the power to actually put away the old self and put on the new man. To escape from Babylon in the language of Zechariah and find a new home in Zion. Find a new home with the people of God. To come from every direction as the four winds have scattered us across the globe and be made new and be welcomed in to, to this unique, holy, chosen nation that is without borders and without walls. This people where everything that would have identified us according to the world standards is stripped away. And we're now just identified as God's people, as Jesus' people, who have been remade and who are constantly being refined, sanctified, to resemble his image. In this people that spans across the globe, there can be no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, or slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. That's from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, at verse 11. All this to say, right, this all can boil down to one statement, that it is by the work of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the kingship of Jesus, 
as he now sits at the right hand of the Father. It is by the work of Jesus that his church is put together. He sits as the head and he assembles the rest of the body. It's by the life-saving power of the gospel that people are called out of the world, regenerated, born again, made new, and made into God's people. Brought into covenant with Him. To belong to Him. To live for His pleasure. And according to His will. It's by the power of the gospel that God becomes our God. And we become His people. Joined together for eternity. It is not a stretch at all. In fact, I'd say it's the proper interpretation to say that this vision in Zechariah chapter 2, what it reveals is the church. What it reveals is the future for God's people, which we now live in, as the ecclesia of Jesus Christ, the assembly of Jesus. And we are given, between all these verses, such a beautiful picture of what the church is and how the church lives. Because just go back and review and see everything that it includes. In those calls, you know, up, up, escape from Babylon. Escape to Zion. You know, run to God. Run to the people of God. You know, that reminds us that, that the church is a, a body of people, all of whom have been called out from the world. All of whom have been ransomed from the world. By the precious blood of the spotless lamb, as Peter would put it. All of us at one time heard that call to abandon the ways that we knew and to come under the ways of God. All of us were given grace to see that there was another way of life, a truer way of life than everything that we understood before. All of us were given grace to believe that our sins could actually be wiped away. That we could have new life and and live in this world as new creations. Able to do things that we were never able to do before. Things like forgive. Things like have patience, give love. Even to repay evil with good. Things like to have peace in a rather chaotic place. We are a people who, by the power of God, have been allowed to escape from Babylon and find a home with each other in His presence. We are a people who now get to live every day in the presence of God. He's no longer contained in the the holy of holies in the tabernacle or the temple. He still dwells in his temple, of course, but his temple is now his people. Scriptures promise us that the Spirit of God is in every single one of his children. In fulfillment of other prophecies, by the way, spoken by Joel, that God would pour out his Spirit across all of his people. His church is the place of His presence. That's why we can have the promise that anytime we gather together, even if it's just two or three of us, He is there. That means even if there was some scenario where there was only two or three of us left, the presence of God is still there with His people. Perhaps most beautifully, in this vision we see that the church is to be this people who dwells in the world without walls but that God himself has actually promised to give us protection by making himself as he said a wall of fire around his people let's stick with that without walls thing for a second because man that can mean a lot I think maybe the most obvious thing is that to live without walls, to be a people 
without walls around us. It means that God has called us to, to live in this world without erecting thick and high barriers that keep people out. The church of Jesus Christ is to be open to anyone who might be curious about it. Our lives are to be open to anyone whom God might send our way. Because we're called to share the gospel with all of them. To bear the fruit of the Spirit for all of them. Everyone is welcome to come and dwell here among us. Because anyone might be the next one called out from the world to come and believe in the work of Jesus, to come and receive the same salvation that we have. So we can't be afraid or hesitant or, or, or too closed off or, or too prejudiced or, or anything else that might stop us. We can't let anything stop us from showing the gospel's life-saving, life-changing power to anyone who God might send our way. We can't let anything stop us from verbally sharing the gospel with anyone who God might send our way. The whole world is entitled to hear the gospel preached, to hear the word of God taught, to hear that Jesus has died for the forgiveness of their sins. I don't care what someone has done to you. There is no one on earth who you are entitled to not share the gospel with. There's no one in this world who we are entitled to just block out and totally ignore, to give no love to, offer no forgiveness to, give no grace to. James would remind us that it would be a sin for us when we assemble together, to even treat someone with partiality. To give preferential treatment to one person over the next. For anyone who we encounter, I'd say here in this building or out there in the world, the Lord has commanded us to greet them with hospitality and to show them the depth of love that's been given to us. To show them what it means for a heart of stone to be replaced by a heart of flesh. For a person who was once dead in rebellion to be made alive. To be allowed to dwell in the heavenly places with Jesus. I think that's what it means to dwell without walls. Now in Zechariah's day, that idea that Jerusalem would, would be rebuilt but wouldn't have walls around it. That would have sounded like suicidal insanity. They were only 70 years removed from being hauled away as slaves by an invading army. What do you mean we're not going to have walls now? The entire city was destroyed. The temple was leveled. People were taken all the way off to Babylon and made to live in chains. The people of Zechariah's time probably thought, hey, if anything, you know, Jerusalem 2.0 needs bigger walls, higher walls, thicker walls, more guards with more weapons because we've got to do a really good job this time of keeping everyone out. That's why God said in this vision there in verse 5, he gave them that promise that he would dwell like a wall of fire around his people. He would be their security. He would be their safety. Yes, they were surrounded by enemies. Yes, those enemies were dangerous. But what that wall of fire thing means is that Israel really can put away all the fear and anxiety they might have about that and just focus on faithfully serving the Lord. They really could live for him 100% and have peace about it. Philistines are over here. Persians are over here. The Samaritans are all 
straggling around somewhere looking to bring about our downfall and do us harm. But God's got us. God's promised to be our wall. Israel didn't have to worry about what the nations were up to. That's the point of of that part of the vision. They could dedicate all of themselves to doing His will if they would just believe in His promises. Centuries later, you know, it feels so often like God's people, we still struggle with that same problem, don't we? Jesus has promised to be our good shepherd. That He watches out for His flock. That nothing and no one can snatch us out of His hand. God is still our safety, our security. But we're still a people who struggle to believe in that. We're still a people who struggle to lean into and and live out the promises and the decrees of God to hold us in His hands as His precious, chosen, beloved people and keep us safe. He has promised to be our security, to be our fortress, to be our defense. You know, the best thing we could do to make our own safety with the work of our hands would be to build walls of brick and stone that if Israel had learned anything could be knocked down, smashed through, and climbed over. So God promises to be for them something even better, a wall of fire. That means if anybody's going to come and mess with his people, they will quite literally have to go through him. They will have to crawl through fire to do any harm to the children of God. We can dwell securely in this world. We can be a people of peace in this world. Gosh, doesn't that theme seem to come up again and again and again in these prophetic visions? You know, I'm, of course, friends with a lot of other pastors. Go to little events, talk with pastors about things like growth and attendance and giving and all that stuff. And you know, those conversations are so often filled with anxiety and and genuine fear, like trembling fear about what the next year, a lot of my pastor friends and I, you know, we've all just finalized our budgets for the next year. And it's like, I don't know if the giving's going to be there, but you know, we got to pay for this and we got to pay for that. We're just going to have to see what God does. A lot of those conversations are filled with fear. But you know, we have a Lord who has promised to build his church. So what are we all so worried about? We have a God who's promised to be our security, to be our safety. So what are we all so worried about? Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. Why does that seem like it's such a hard promise for us to believe in? If we trust in him to protect his people, then we really have to live like he actually is enough for us to not have this kind of fear anymore. He's called us to be a set-apart people. He's given us his spirit so that we can be a set-apart people. As Peter would remind us in 2 Peter in, in chapter 1 there, he's given us every single thing that we need to live lives of holiness and godliness. He's given us everything we need to be a people of peace. To be a people who who can love one another so much that the world actually takes notice of how radically and how genuinely we love each other. We can be a people who, who can offer forgiveness to people who absolutely haven't earned it. Who can endure all things without grumbling, without anxiety, without anger who can count it all joy even when fiery trials come our way. I guess I've been thinking a lot about that that point throughout these prophetic sermons that 
that, perhaps most of all, in the season in which we live, in the generation in which we dwell, might be the thing that sets us apart most from the world. That even with everything going on around us, we're still a people of joy. We're still a people who have peace. We're not ignorant. We're not stupid. We know what's happening around us. We know its significance. We know what it means. But we just have so much trust in the promises of our God. We have so much trust in, in Jesus' promises that even the highest authorities on earth can't take away our salvation, can't take away our inheritance, can't really do us any genuine harm that we can go out there and, and, and live uniquely among the world as a people who just, who just aren't so worried and who just aren't so mad, who aren't panicked all the time, who, who aren't marching out to go to war with everybody and everything, who are a people of genuine peace. What could set us apart from the world we live in more than that? More than a gentle and quiet life. In a world filled with noise, a gentle and quiet life is holy. And you know, that's, that's the last little bit, I, I think, of the picture we get of the church that I wanted to mention this morning is that we are a people who, as it says in verse 10, can always sing and rejoice. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. If we believe in the promises of God, if we we believe in the salvation that's been given to us by his sacrifice, by his resurrection, then we always have reason to be a people who can sing and rejoice, to be a joyful people. You know, it was Paul and Silas when they were in jail in Philippi for crimes that they didn't commit. You know, they were wrongfully imprisoned and they had no idea what might lie in their future. You think they were prisoners' rights in like 60 A.D.? No. There's barely prisoners' rights now. They were in chains, shackled to the floor, shackled to the wall. And they kept people up all night because they just wouldn't stop singing. They wouldn't stop rejoicing and singing hymns from their cell. The martyrs in Revelation chapter 7 when you get a picture of them marching around in the heavens, are singing with joy to be in the presence of God. We get to dwell in the presence of God every day. That's another promise of these visions, that He dwells with us, that we will know He dwells with us. So in every season, in every hour, we have the capacity for joy we have reason to sing out and rejoice because of what our God has done, because of who He is, because we know He sits sovereign on His throne every hour of every day. I'd remind us that Paul writes in the book of Philippians, and this is actually written from prison, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. So, as the band rejoins us, um, we'll just dwell on that. That last little note. Don't be in a rush to build walls. Don't try to build them high. Don't try to build them around everything you have and, and everyone you know. Because God has called us to live here as a people without walls. To trust in Him to be our wall. The world can do no real harm to God's people. The world cannot take away the things that are most precious to us. Can't even, the world can't even really take away the brothers and sisters who we have and who we love. Because we know whenever the day comes that God calls on us to go and be with Him. 
they'll be there too. Someday we'll get to dwell together in this new Jerusalem in a place where there will be no more sin, there will be no fear, there will be no injury or illness or sadness or tears anymore. But we'll just be worshiping and rejoicing all the time. You know the beautiful thing about the gospel? One of the beautiful things about the gospel? You get a taste of that now. You can live at least a little bit that way right now. And God has given you everything you need to do. You know, I hope whenever we finish with this book of the 12, all these minor prophet guys, if, if all of this preaching and all of the time studying and writing and stuff has any effect on us as body, that we'll just be a people who aren't so angry and aren't so afraid at the end of this. So I don't know when the series is going to end, but I know what year we're in. And in November, there's going to be some big things that happen. And I guess we'll find out. <laughs> We'll find out if we've really been hearing and believing all this stuff that the prophets have been telling us. Anyway, let's worship our God together. The solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. The rock won't move, yeah, the rock won't move. And when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. The rock won't move, yeah, the rock won't move.
my prayer and my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. And this is my prayer in the fire. In weakness or trial or pain. There is a faith proved of more worth than gold. So refine me, Lord, through the flame. And I will bring really easy to look back to the past and find things that we desperately wish we still had. Look at old pictures and say, man, I want that body back. Go back into your wedding album and say, man, I remember when our marriage was like that before kids and jobs and everything else. 
you even look around our church and say, man, I remember when there were so many more people and bigger things, bigger building, more money, all that stuff. I think if we can walk away having learned something from Zechariah this morning, it's, you know, God has not brought us here so that we can be anxious to get back things that we used to have. God has brought us here so we can sing and rejoice with what he's given us for today. And he's given us these promises so that we can trust that whatever he brings to us in the future will actually be greater than what we had in the past. So if you look at those pictures and you go, man, I wish I had that body back. Hey, man, God's going to give you a new body someday. And it's going to be greater than any chapter of your life here. If you look back and you say, man, I remember when my marriage was like that. Well, maybe God can give you an even greater marriage today. Or if we look around our church and say, man, I remember when our church was like that. Well, maybe God's doing something where our church is going to do even greater things than it did back then. Anyway, uh, as part of our rhythm of life here at Rockridge Church, we like to gather together for prayer in this side room over here. So if there's something today that you need to pray about or or you'd like to be prayed over, uh, go ahead and take a beat, grab a water, and join us in these chairs over here. Uh, I am actually looking. That's cool. <laughs> uh, I'm actually looking for a few sets of hands. Uh, we have some Christmas decorations that we just kind of tucked away in the storage area over here that we really need to bring back to their proper home in the storage trailer that's, that's down past the classroom. So if anybody's got time and, and you're willing to pick up a couple of heavy boxes with me, Uh, feel free to see me after and we'll get that done, okay? So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance on you and give you peace until we're together again.